Amen, amen. Uh, how many of you know Einstein's definition of ins insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, right? Uh, if you've never heard that before, uh, that's who it's been attributed to, uh, Albert Einstein. And it's a, great, <clears throat> it's a great truth, it's a great axiom, if you will, uh, to apply to the, the book of Isaiah and the message of the book of Isaiah, at least part of its message. Because the book of Isaiah uh, talks to and addresses Israel in, in a tremendous, profound spiritual dilemma. A spiritual dilemma where the same things happen over and over and over again and the people and the leadership seem to respond the same way somehow hoping that there's going to be a different result. And it's spiritual lunacy, if you will. And the book is all about Israel's dependence on everything but God and God's call to Israel to depend on nothing but Him. And that's the basic story of the book. And in, in chapter 40, in those, the verses uh, following, uh, the chapters following, we, we kept talking about over and over again, uh, the, th the same thing emerged over and over again. Idols, bad, God, good. Trust God, not the idols. And so as Israel moved from God, spiritually the bottom would fall out of them nationally, it would fall out economically, socially, politically. Uh, they would suffer the curses that God said he would bring on them, the want that he would bring on them uh, as part of the Sinai covenant. And the cycle is repeated over and over and over again, not only uh, as we see in the book of Isaiah itself, but we see it also in Israel's history as it is revealed to us by God's word from beginning to end. In fact, I want to remind us, before we get into Isaiah chapter 52 and 53 this morning, I want, to, I want to remind us that in the opening chapter of Isaiah, he casts his entire message in the context of Israel's chronic spiritual sickness and, debilitate, and, it's, and, those, and their debilitating consequences. And so uh, take your scripture out, if you will, and turn all the way back to the first chapter of the book of Isaiah. And I want to read just a few of these verses because I think having these verses clear in our mind, refreshed in our mind, will be important as we read Isaiah chapter 52 verse 13 all the way through 53 verse 12 because I believe that what Isaiah is talking about in the chapters we're gonna be looking at today is God's solution to the very thing that he describes so amazingly here in the first chapter. Uh, look with me, if you will, at chapter 1, beginning with verse 4. Alas, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who, sons who act corruptly. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away from him. Where will you be stricken again as you continue in your rebellion? The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is nothing sound in it. Only bruises and welts and raw wounds, not pressed out or bandaged, nor softened with oil. Your land is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your fields, strangers are devouring them in your presence. It is desolation as overthrown by strangers. The daughter of Zion, this is refer reference to Jerusalem in particular, the daughter of Zion is like a shelter in a vineyard, like a watchman's hut in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. Unless the Lord of hosts had left us a few survivors, we would be like Sodom, we would be like Gomorrah. You see the picture that the book of Isaiah starts with. It's this picture of, I, of Israel's chronic spiritual illness and the devastating consequences that it has on them. And as we look around at the world 
we see the same kind of spiritual insanity lived out over and over and over again. Nations rise, nations fall. Nations come into power and become wealthy. Then those who are supposed to be leading and caring for the nation start feeding themselves instead of the flock they're supposed to care for. And the nation falls into decay and people suffer as a result. And the, the, the next attempt is what? It's a new government, a new system, a new political understanding that is employed. And the same thing happens and collapse takes place. And we can think about the, the, the same way in terms of our uh, religious affections as individuals and our tendency towards religiosity that we continue as a people, as a species, as the human race, we continue to seek answers for the lack of peace in our lives by looking around us by designing our own systems of religion, by designing our own philosophies of life, by designing our own uh, systems of psychology and all of the things that we cling to and look to to try to find some sense of peace, some sense of well-being, some sense of, no, I know it's going to work out. Some confidence that it will work out and everything that we try fails. Everything that we try fails. And so it, it, it's an amazing thing that, that this happens over and over again, that we are incapable of changing ourselves. You ever notice that? That we as human beings are incapable of changing ourselves. And January 1st, the beginning of a new year, is a great illustration of that. It's a great illustration of that. Now, why is it a great illustration of that? Because what is traditionally done with the new year? We do. We make what? Besides fools of ourselves, we make resolutions. We make resolutions. And how many of us are able to persist and keep those resolutions? None of us. In fact, I love this cartoon. It was shown in, uh, I think it was the January 2nd, issue of the Chicago Tribune and it's this cartoon and it says uh, this is one of my favorite cartoons Prickly City it says it's a new year Carmen yep a time of new beginnings indeed what resolutions are you going to break first <laughs> I was going to give up snark but now <laughs> Just that we cannot change ourselves. You see that? That's, that's an acknowledgement of that. That we cannot change ourselves. And the more we try thinking something different is going to happen, the more it demonstrates Einstein's theory of insanity. <laughs> that trying the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result is completely insane. And that is where we are spiritually. That is where we are spiritually. And so our text this morning, we want to be asking ourselves as we go through this text, what does Isaiah teach us about breaking the cycle of insanity that keeps us from a relationship with God and that keeps us from enjoying the peace, the contentment, the wholeness that he desires for his creation? What is it? And so what Isaiah teaches us is he says through this, te this text, he says, Behold and believe the servant. Behold and believe the servant. And we're going to look at our text to see how it is that Isaiah wants us to behold the servant in particular, because that's what this text is primarily about. It's primarily Isaiah's explanation to us or God's explanation through the prophet Isaiah of the role of the servant and so he wants us to behold the servant why because the servant is God's outrageous unexpected startling solution to Israel's dilemma you got that it is God's unexpected outrageous startling solution to Israel's dilemma, to their problem, to the fact that the thing keeps going around and around and around, and how is this ever going to change? 
And this is God's solution. And so the first thing, the first thing I want to mention is, is that the, the passage is broken up into five uh, couplets, or not couplets, uh, five groups of three verses. Uh, the first one is verse, verses 13 to 15 in chapter 52, then verses 1 through 3, verses 4 through 6, verses 7 through 9, and verses 10 to 12. And so we're going to look at those chunks. We're going to give an overview of each of those chunks so we get a picture of what it is that Isaiah wants us to see. Because he starts out this way in chapter 52, verse 13. Behold, look, pay attention. I had uh, one of my favorite professors in, uh, in Bible college. was a guy named Buck Hatch. And Buck was a wonderful teacher, wonderful teacher. And he, he would be teaching, and, and then he would have something important to say. And he would say, look up here. Look up. You know, because why? Because we would all feverishly be slavishly writing notes. Because why? Because we want to do well on the exam. And he had something important he wanted to tell us. And so God says through the prophet, Behold, look up, pay attention, my servant. And then he goes on to tell us about his servant. And so he goes on in these verses and he says, Behold, my servant will prosper. And this idea of prosper here in the text really means to succeed. He means he will succeed. And he says he will be high and lifted, lifted up and greatly exalted. Now, it's so interesting that he starts out this way because everything that comes next until the very end of the passage is the exact opposite of highly exalted and lifted up. Because everything else that comes is going to be about suffering and de degradation. And so he says, behold, my servant will prosper and will, he will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. So he's saying, now look, before I tell you the bad news, I want you to know that there's a good outcome. I want you to, it's almost like a disclaimer, that, uh, a spoiler alert, if you will. And he goes on in verse 14 and he says, just as many, that is uh, the surrounding nations, were astonished at you, meaning the nation of Israel, so his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of man. In other words, that he suffered in a unique way, that he suffered physically. But I want you to understand that, that, again, I believe that the overall context of this is not a focus so much on physical suffering as it is on the consequences of spiritual sin. And that God's servant will suffer horribly beyond what anyone else has ever suffered because of sin, because of sin. And then he goes on in verse 15 and he says, thus he will sprinkle many nations. And there's a, there's a debate among scholars whether this word uh, which is typically used in the Torah uh, for sprinkle, uh, whether it means sprinkle or whether it's more related to a, uh, a word in Arabic that, that uh, means to startle. And so some translations have startle, some translations have sprinkle in it. And uh, you, can, you can argue back and forth, I like sprinkle because it takes you right back to all of the passages in Leviticus that talk about the blood and the atoning impact of the blood. But I do think that there is uh, at least some argument to be made for the startle because it fits the context. Because it goes on to say, he will sprinkle many nations kings will shut their mouths on account of him. They will shut their mouths in shock. They will be amazed by him because of what God accomplishes through him. For what, not, for what, what had not been told them, they will see, and what they had not heard, they will understand. And according to Paul in Romans chapter 15 and verse 21, this is the message that they are going to hear and they are going to be amazed by. And so it's an introduction to the servant. And it's this introduction that tells us, first of all, that he is going to 
when, in the end, he's going to be exalted and lifted up, but that he is going to be grossly misunderstood. And the idea here is, is that God's solution is that the servant is going to be exalted in spite of suffering. In spite of suffering. You got that? Because he starts out and he says he's going to be exalted, but he's also going to suffer. And so he's going to be exalted in spite of of suffering. And then he goes on in chapter 53, we have uh, an explanation of the servants, uh, if you will, his, uh, his I, don't, I don't know what word to use this, but uh, his, his course. In other words, the way his ministry is going to go, what it's going to look like. And again, this is broken up into three uh, chunks of three verses. And the first one is verses 1 through 3. And so what Isaiah wants us to understand is that the servant is rejected by us. He's rejected by us. In verses 1, he says, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And the arm of the Lord is, is a picture of God's might, God's power, God's work the things God is going to accomplish. And we, of course, believe that this is a direct reference to the Messiah, uh, to Jesus. He says, For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He had no stately form nor majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. And so I believe what's going on here in part is that earlier in the book of Isaiah, we saw the imagery of trees, of cedars and oaks. And what did they stand for? They stood for the nations of the world around Israel. They stood for the power and might of kings. And so Isaiah is telling us that in that contrast, in contrast to that picture, we have this one who is going to be like a root out of dry ground, like like you don't even notice it. You just walk over it. There's no stately form to him that you would go, oh yes, this is a great leader. This is a great king but he's going to be humble instead. And he goes on in verse 3. He says, He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted, the NASB here says, with grief, but it can be translated with sickness. With sickness. And I, and I think that's a better translation. Why? Because it helps us remember to look back to Isaiah chapter 1. And the way Isaiah takes pains to describe Israel's spiritual condition in terms of being beaten and sick in the worst ways. And so he says, uh, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief or with sickness. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. We meaning Israel did not esteem him. He was completely ignored. He was rejected by us. We did not recognize in him any greatness. Any greatness. Now, we we know that in Yeshua's ministry, there were people who did come to him, who did believe in him. But there was no sense of the kind of majesty uh, that, that other rulers had that attracted the nations to him, that attracted hordes of people to him as a ruler that anyone would recognize as a ruler. And so he was rejected by us. This servant, Messiah, God's servant, the Messiah, is rejected by us. So he's, the servant is exalted in spite of his suffering. The servant is rejected by us. And if you think about it, the people of Jesus' day did that very thing, did they not? Even those who had welcomed him into Jerusalem the day where he rode in on a donkey and they cried out, Hosanna, God save us. And they were expecting a ruling king to enter Jerusalem, turned their backs on him and rejected him. And instead of saying, he is our king, they said to the king, crucify him, crucify him. And so he was rejected. And then not only was the servant rejected by us, verses 4 through 6 tell us that the servant suffered for us. He was rejected by us, 
but he suffered for us. Look at verse four. Surely our griefs he himself bore. And again, the word here can be translated sickness. Sickness, it's the same word we read in chapter one, verse five. Surely our sickness he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. And isn't that exactly the scene that we see at the, at the cross? You know, we see the, the, this one, the, he, the king of the Jews and we see uh, the religious leadership saying, if, if he's so tight with God, let God deliver him. And so the assumption built in there is that he is under God's wrath. No one could be crucified apart from being under God's wrath in some way. And so he says he was smitten of God and afflicted. That was our assumption. And then he goes on in verse 5. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our, listen, well-being fell upon him. And guess what the word well-being is? Shalom. Our shalom. Our wholeness. Our wholeness. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. And we know from the gospel text that he was literally pierced through with nails. He was pierced by a crown of thorns. Uh, after his death, he was pierced with a spear. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our shalom fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. We are healed. Now, now you, if you're not reading this in the context, if you're not reading this in the context of Isaiah chapter 1 and the description, this horrible description of the spiritual condition of our people, if you read it in that context, you read, whoa, whoa, that's an amazing idea that the servant suffered for us and as a result of his suffering the shalom that was absent from our lives becomes a part of our lives and so the servant is he is rejected by us he suffered for us and then verses 7 to 9 the servant died instead of us he died instead of us verse 7 he was oppressed and he was afflicted yet yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shears so he did not open his mouth and and the scriptures tell us the new covenant scriptures in first peter chapter 2 it tells us that even though he was being treated unjustly in the grossest way at the point of his crucifixion that he did not respond by reviling or uttering any threats that's exactly what this text says in isaiah that it's not that he was completely silent that he said nothing to no one at all during that time but that he did not respond in kind. And even though he could have and had the authority and the power and the right to revile and to utter threats in his love and his grace and his mercy and in fulfillment of this passage, he remained silent. Verse 8, by oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? You see that? That's called substitutionary atonement. And you would not understand the significance of that unless you were reading the rest of the Torah. And unless you understood Leviticus, unless you understood the sacrifice that was made of the, of the, <clears throat> the goat that was sacrificed or the, the, the lamb that was sacrificed in the garden that was given for the sin of Adam and Eve so that they could be clothed in his skin. 
and the ram that was offered in Isaac's stead and the, the goats and the lambs that were offered, the lamb that was offered at Passover and the goats that were offered at Yom Kippur, that it is in the shedding of blood that we find atonement. It is in the shedding of blood, it is in the exchange of death for life that we find forgiveness. And that is exactly what Isaiah is saying here for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. This cannot be about Israel. I'm sorry, it's sorry. The, the, the text, the servant cannot be Israel. Why? Because the stroke that fell him, that killed him, was due to us. We deserve to die. We deserve to be cut off from God not just one generation or several generations, but we deserve to be cut off from God for all generations and every member of that generation because of our sin. And it says clearly that the servant uh, suffered for us, but the servant died instead of us. He, and it goes on, and, and after, just to make sure that we understand that, that the prophet is talking about death here, he says, his grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Now, why would he mention that? He would mention that because anybody else who died, other than someone who himself was sinless, would be simply paying the penalty of his own sin. But only one who was without sin can pay the penalty of those who have sinned. And so he tells us that the servant himself is sinless and that the servant gave his life, his death, counted and took the place of our death. And his grave... Even his grave, and we read in the, in the gospel accounts, Jesus was crucified with criminals on either side, and yet he was laid in the tomb of a righteous, wealthy man. Even that degree of fulfillment is evident in this text. But not only is a servant rejected by us, suffered for us, died instead of us, the concluding verses... Verses 10 through 12 of chapter 53, Isaiah wants to make sure we understand the servant is exalted because of his suffering. Because of his suffering. Don't miss that. It starts out, the introduction tells us that the, that the servant is exalted in spite of his suffering. But now he tells us that the servant is exalted because of his suffering. Verse 10. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. Uh, another translation there again, made him sick. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days. The pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. See that? It says, the Lord was pleased to crush him. The Lord was pleased. This was not an accident. This was not the, the whims of history and the whims of fate that Jesus was in the wrong place at the wrong time preaching the wrong message. No, this was God's will. This was God's foreordained plan. And his plan was to what? It was outrageous. It was unexpected. It was unthinkable. His plan was to crush him putting him to grief or making, made him sick, if he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And so the, the point is, is that if the servant does the things that God ordained be done, then God's will is going to happen. God's will is going to happen. And he goes on in verse 11. And he talks about what that will is, what the, the, the good pleasure of the Lord is. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it, or he will see light, some translations say, and be satisfied. 
by his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many and will bear their iniquities. Will bear their iniquities. Now, I, I, I want you to think about this. This is so important. This, this point is so important. And I want you to, to take a moment and turn back with me to Isaiah chapter 48. Uh, and we've, we've, we've looked at this a couple of times in the last few weeks, but I want to remind us of it again because it's so important. Look at the beginning of chapter 48. He says this, Hear this, O house of Jacob, who, are, who named Israel, who came forth from the loins of Judah, who swear by the name of the Lord and invoke the God of Israel, but not in truth or in righteousness. For they call themselves after the holy city, meaning Jerusalem, and lean on the God of Israel, the Lord of hosts is his name. I declare, and, and so basically God is rebuking Israel. He's saying, look, you use my name, you claim me as your God, but you really are not walking faithfully with me. And then he goes on uh, in verse 16, and he says, come near to me, listen to this. From the first, I have not spoken in secret. From the time it took place, I was there. And now the Lord has sent me and his spirit. Uh, let's see, wait a minute, I'm sorry. I need to get to the right verse. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Verse 17 and 18. Thus says the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you in the way you should go. If only you had paid attention to my commandments, then your well-being, your what? Your shalom, your wholeness, would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. He said, it can happen, but your sin prevents it from happening. And then he tells us why the loony cycle goes on and on and on and why we experience the kinds of negative things we experience over and over again. In verse 22, he says this very simple phrase, there is no shalom for the wicked, says the Lord. There is no shalom for the wicked, says the Lord. That means you and I, as well as the nation of Israel, cannot expect to find shalom in any lasting measure until our wickedness is dealt with, until our sin is dealt with. And that's exactly what Isaiah says the servant will do in his conclusion. He says at the end of verse 11, my servant will justify the many and he will bear their iniquities. The servant will justify, will bring about the declaring righteous of many as a result of him bearing their iniquities. Then it goes on, therefore I will allot him, and, and this is God speaking, therefore I will allot him a portion with the great and he will divide the booty with the strong. And I believe that's a reference back to the kings that are mentioned earlier in our passage. Because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Do you see the picture here? The picture is, is that, that God is going to exalt his servant because of what the servant has accomplished for the people who needed him to accomplish it. And so he says, behold the servant, behold this one, this one who is God's outrageous, unexpected, startling solution to Israel's problem. He is the one who is exalted in spite of his suffering. He is the servant who was rejected by the people he came to serve. He is the servant who suffered for us. He is a servant who died instead of us. He is a servant who is exalted by God because of his suffering and the good that comes from it. And the good that comes from it. And you see that very same idea, that last one, that the servant is exalted because of his suffering. 
in Philippians chapter 2. I won't take the time to go there now, but if you want to look it up later, I would encourage you to do so because Paul understood this in a unique way. And so the servant... The servant is to be seen, behold, to be understood, to recognize his role, to recognize that God promised seven, over 700 years before Jesus walked the earth that one would come, his arm, his servant would come and would accomplish these things in this way. And we can be confident that Jesus is the Messiah because he so perfectly fulfilled these prophecies. And so what? So what? Isaiah, I think, challenges us to not only behold the servant, but to believe the servant as well. What should our response be having beheld the servant? And I I want you to think about this for a second. I want you to think about this. Imagine how Peter and the disciples felt at, at the end of Jesus' life, at the crucifixion and burial. Just think about it. The guy they had been living with for three years. The guy they called Lord and Master. The guy they had seen perform profound and unique, unheard of miracles. The one who had raised the dead, restored sight to the blind. The one who knew what they were thinking before they said a word. Died. Was a victim of unjust men. Sinful men seeking to protect their own power. The wheels had fallen off their expectation in a profound, profound way. Can you imagine that? Imagine what they were thinking. Oh, what a fool I was. I wasted three years of my life following this guy. He's not the Messiah. He's not the king we were hoping for. There's no hope in him. There's no life in him. He couldn't even save his own life. And then he rises from the dead. Then he runs into the guys walking down from Jerusalem, you know. They're going home. They're disappointed. And he opens the scriptures with them. And he begins to tell them what God's plan was. And can you imagine the impact it must have had on the Apostle Peter to go back and read Isaiah 52 and 53 in context and go, What? That was God's plan? What? That was how God was going to bring forgiveness for my sin? Even my rejecting and my turning my back on him in his greatest need? His mind must just must have been completely, completely blown away. Peter and the apostles understood this. They understood how outrageous this idea was, how outrageous this solution was, but how real it was and how how it accomplished what nothing else was able to accomplish in producing the forgiveness of sin and to providing justification in the sight of a holy God. The things they perceived as failure became the very substance of the good news that they preached. You get that? The very thing that they saw as failure in his death now became the very substance of the thing we call and they called good news. The good news. And you you know that joke, it's a bad joke, and I'll ask your forgiveness for it. When somebody says to me, you Jews killed Jesus, my response is what? Aren't you glad we did? Now, of course, I have to explain that a little bit. But that's the point, isn't it? That the good news is that in God's sovereign mercy, looking at Israel and the hopelessness of the cycle in which they found themselves, their inability to find a place of shalom, to come to the place of fulfillment, and humanity's like likewise inability to come to that place of shalom to find forgiveness to find unity with God God in his mercy sends his son the perfect one to give himself as a sacrifice to provide what we cannot provide for ourselves and what what's so amazing that 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 this really does become the substance of the good news. I'm not going to take the time 
to go there, but I, I just want to reference this. Acts chapter 13. Uh, this is the Apostle Paul, uh, beginning in verse 16, I think. The Apostle Paul is preaching a sermon in a synagogue in Pisidian Antioch. And so this is the beginning of his, of his missionary journeys. He's going out into the world. And of course, he stops in synagogues first in Pisidian and Antioch. He stops there and he's preaching a message in the synagogue. And part of the message clearly follows the outline of Isaiah 53. It follows the outline of Isaiah 53, particularly uh, Acts chapter 13, verses 26 to 30. In, va- in verse 27, it's an allusion to Isaiah 53, 1 through 3. In verse 28, it's an allusion to verses 4 through 8. In 29, it's an allusion to verse 9. And then uh, in verse 30, it's an allusion to verse 10. And then if you skip down a few verses in Acts, in verses 38 and 39, there's a clear allusion to Isaiah 53, 11, and 12 as he applies his message to the people of Pisidian Antioch. And he says this to them. He says this. He says, I do want to read this. He says in uh, verses 38 and 39, "Let let it, therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you and that through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. And he follows the good news according to Isaiah 52 and 53. And he preaches a message and he says, if you believe that God accomplished what he said he was going to accomplish and what I am telling you he accomplished in the person of Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, then you will be freed from that cycle of lunacy, that spiritual cycle of sin that cannot be broken by man no matter how hard we try and is broken only by God through the person of Messiah. And so that is the belief that to which we are called through Isaiah's message, that we are to behold the the servant and what he would accomplish, but it isn't just enough to behold it and to see it. He calls us to believe it. He calls us to believe it. And so this morning, if you have not put your faith in what God has done for you in the person of his servant, He is calling to you to not only behold his servant, but to believe him, to trust him, to believe, yes, God, I see the loony cycle in my life. I see the sin that separates me from you. I see more and more that there's nothing I can do and nothing anyone else can do for me to break that cycle. But you can in the Messiah. You said you would do it. You did it in the person of Jesus and I believe that and I want that for my life. And if you put your trust in him, he will save you. He will change you. He will transform you as his spirit takes up residence in your life and brings life where there was death and light where there was blindness. So we would encourage you today to put your faith in God's servant, Messiah Jesus. And for those of us who have already done that, same application. I keep, I've said this over and over again these, these weeks, but I'm convinced more and more as we study this book, this is part of the application. This is the message. This is the message, the message of God's outrageous, crazy plan to save people that his son, the sinless one, would come and die as a servant for the many and would give his life as an atoning sacrifice so that all who would believe in him could be saved from that sin cycle, from that lunacy, from the insanity that marks our lives, that we might have a relationship with God that begins now and extends through all eternity and just keeps getting better and better and better better and better. And so may we be encouraged ourselves to remember that no, we're not insane and that putting our trust in Jesus is a realistic, rational thing to do because it is born out through scripture and in history.
but that it is not just for us. It is a message that the world and the people around us need to hear desperately. May we be encouraged to go out and to share that message with greater boldness and with greater love and greater conviction that it is God's outrageous, crazy plan to save people from their sin. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for uh, these uh, just clear, profound reminders from Isaiah 52 and 53 about the nature of your plan, the, the person of your servant and how completely unexpected and revolutionary your plan is. Lord, I pray for those uh, who have heard this, this message that you would speak to their hearts, that you would open their eyes to see the awe and, and the awesomeness and the amazing nature of your plan for their lives and that through the death, burial, and resurrection of Messiah that you have fulfilled your word not only to Israel but to all who would believe in him that you would break that cycle of sin, that you would bring forgiveness, and that ultimately you will bring shalom to all those who trust in you. Lord, may they find that shalom starting today through faith in Messiah. And Lord, for those of us who know you, deepen our appreciation for that gift. Deepen our awe and amazement of what you have done for us and what you were willing to suffer and bear to provide the atonement that we need and that you gave it to us freely, and that it is ours simply through faith in your Son. Lord, we thank you for that gift. Give us a greater appreciation for it that it might result in a greater zeal to share it in love with the people around us. Lord, we thank you. We ask all these things in Yeshua's name. Amen.